In this short video, we're going to look at equations of lines. But wait, you say, we studied lines back in elementary algebra. What more could we possibly learn? Well, okay, let's start by revisiting what we learned in elementary algebra. We looked at uh, e equations of lines in the plane, so only two variables. And we used, for example, the slope intercept form. And the slope-intercept form is a great equation because it tells us something about the direction or orientation of the line. We get that from the slope. And then its position in the plane is determined by the b value, which is the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. Now, what we could do differently is instead of writing it in this uh, Cartesian fashion is we could use vectors. We could provide the same information about the direction or orientation and the position using vectors. We would need a direction vector. So taking the same information from the slope, which is rise over run, we could write a direction vector V, which with components run, as the horizontal component, and rise as the vertical component. And then we could choose a point on the line, like the y-intercept, and have its position vector as our initial vector. Now, we don't really have to choose an intercept for the initial vector. We can take the position vector of any point on the line. So then what would that tell us? This R of T means the position vector of any point on the line can be determined by choosing a particular value of T and moving from our initial vector the scale factor t times our direction vector. So in other words, if I were to start here at the y-intercept, I could move 1 times the vector v. I'd be at a point here. If I moved a half, I'd be at this point. If I moved 3 times it, 1, 2, and 3, I would be up here. So any point on the line can uh, be described using this equation. So any point has a corresponding position vector and its position vector can be determined using that equation. Now, the real advantage of this vector equation is when we look at 3D. Now, first of all, here I have drawn a line and it may not be clear, but uh, there's no reason for a line in 3D to ever have an intercept with any of the axes. It could be uh, you know, a, a regular line without any special properties, but never intersect any of the coordinate axes. But we can still use the same idea. We just need the position vector of a particular point on the uh, line. And then we need to have a vector which is parallel to the line, so a direction vector. So in this particular example, I know it's difficult to tell with the 3D graph, but the initial vector that I chose was 2, 4, 5. And the direction vector for this line is parallel to negative 1, 2, comma, 3. And so any point on that line can be described using this equation here. So in our most general form, we would write the components of our initial vector as x naught, y naught, z naught. And we write the components of the direction vector as a, b, and c. And these 
numbers A, B, and C are sometimes called the direction numbers of the line. And so then our vector equation would have this form. Now remember that the R of T is the position vector of a point on the line. So the point on the line may have coordinates x, y, z. And so then I can set up my vector equation as being x comma y comma z equals x naught comma y naught comma z naught plus t a b c. Now it may be more useful or more informative or simpler to understand if we just look at the individual component equations. So in the ith component, I would get x equals x naught plus at. For the jth component, I would get y equals y naught plus bt. And in the kth component, I would get z equals z naught plus ct. This set of equations is what we call parametric equations for the line. And again, these numbers a, b, and c are called direction numbers. So we can have a vector equation, we can have parametric equations for a line. Let's look at an example. The line L passes through the point with coordinates negative 1, 2, 3, and it's parallel to the vector with components 3 comma negative 1 comma 2. So we'd like to find a vector equation and parametric equations of the line. Well for a vector equation I need the position vector of a point on the line and I'm given a point so I'll just write its corresponding position vector. I also need the direction vector which I'm also given. I'm told that the line is parallel to this vector so I know the direction vector. So Given that information, I can write down the vector equation. And then uh, to get the parametric equations, well, I'm just going to go ahead and write this as a single vector. And I know that the first component is going to give me the x coordinate, the second component will give me a y component, and the third component will give me the I'm sorry, the y coordinate, the third component gives me the z coordinate. And so from the vector equation, I can easily obtain my parametric equations. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here because uh, the, we really have infinitely many choices when we start writing down the vector equation or parametric equations because we can choose any point on the line. It was very convenient to use the point that was given to me, but from the point that was given to me and the direction vector, I could have calculated the coordinates of a different point on the line, and I didn't have to use the vector that was given to me as the direction vector. I could choose any vector that was parallel to it. I could have used the opposite of that vector. I could have used two times that vector. I could have used pi times that vector. Any multiple of that vector would be parallel to it. So I could have chosen any of the any of those vectors. Obviously I can't choose the zero vector as the direction vector. So for example, I can see that if t equals one, the coordinates of a different point on that line would be 2, 1, 5. Again, just putting t equals 1, I'll get negative 1 plus 3, which is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1, and 3 plus 2 gives me 5. So I could have used this vector, 2, comma 1, comma 5, as my initial vector. And instead of using the given vector, I could have used twice the given vector. Oh, except for 
I seem to have made a mistake here, which I'll have to correct. I only multiplied the first component by two. So let's go ahead and fix that. So what are we doing here? Should have multiplied everything by two. There we go, we'll use that as our direction vector. So then, let's make the correction over here as well. That vector equation would make use of my new position vector and my new direction vector. It's funny, I still made a mistake over here. Not that I made a mistake, it's that I didn't change it yet. I noticed that I changed from T to S because uh, really uh, I should be using a different parameter in, in a sense the this is a very different parameterization. All right. And so then I should get different parametric equations as well. So let me just make my corrections here and I'll do a better job future of proofreading my slides before I start recording. All right, so what would this be? This would be 2 plus 6s, but then this would be 1 minus 2s, and then 5 plus 4s. All right, so the point I'm trying to make here is that the vector equation of a line is not unique. Parametric equations are also not unique. We have another form of writing the equation of a line in space, and it's called symmetric equations of a line. We start with the parametric equations in their most general form, and we solve each equation for t. So I'm going to get three expressions that are equal to each other. From the first equation, I'll get x minus x naught over a, then y minus y naught over b, and then finally z minus z naught over c. So that's what we call symmetric equations. So let's look at a second example. We'll find a vector equation and symmetric equations for the line passing through two given points. So for a vector equation, I need the position vector of one of the points. So I'm given two points. So the position vector is not an issue or the initial vector. Uh, we did need to find the direction vector. Well, the vector that takes me from P to Q is going to be an example of a vector I could use. I could use any vector parallel to PQ. So let's calculate the vector PQ. Remember, we just take the position vector for Q and subtract the position vector for P, and that gives me a vector with components 2, comma, 2, comma, negative 4. Now, I like to use the smallest numbers possible, so I can see that there's a common factor of 2 here so I'm going to choose for my position vector to be half of my PQ vector. So now I get smaller components, 1, 1, negative 2. Still parallel to the original vector, but smaller components. And then for my initial vector, I guess I'll choose the position vector for P. I could have chosen the position vector for Q, 
or any other point on the line. And that gives me my vector equation. Now, to help me write the symmetric equations, I'm just going to make note of the parametric equations and then solve those for t. So uh, solving the first one for t, I get x plus 1. And solving the second one, I'll get y minus 1. And solving the third equation, I get 2 minus z over 2. All right, let's look at another example related to that. We're going to find the points where the line in example two intersects the xy plane and the xz plane. So we'll make use of our symmetric equations. And then we're going to remember that on the xy plane, z equals 0. So going to my symmetric, symmetric equations, if I replace z with 0, then in my third equation, I get 2 over 2, which is 1. Now I can solve for x and solve for y to get the coordinates of the point. Now, let's think about this a little bit more carefully and go through it a little bit slowly. How did I get x equal to 0? Well, I just know that x plus 1 uh, equals 1, right? So I can solve the equation x plus 1 equals 1. And that means that x equals 0. And I can do the same thing with the y. y minus 1 equals 1, so y would have to equal 2. And then, because we're on the xy plane, z equals 0. So that's how I get z equals 0. Now, on the xz plane, y equals 0. So I know the y coordinate's going to be 0. And back in my symmetric equations, I'm going to replace y with 0. So that means I'll get x plus 1 equals negative 1, or 2 minus z over 2 equals negative 1. So for my x value or x coordinate, I'll solve the equation x plus 1 equals negative 1. So that tells me x equals negative 2. And then I'll, for the z, I'll have to solve 2 minus z over 2 equals negative 1. So I'll multiply both sides by 2 to get 2 minus z equals negative 2. And so then that tells me that z would have to equal 4. So I get negative 2 from this equation, positive 4 from this equation, and 0 because I'm on the xz plane. So the last thing I want to talk about here are uh, equations of line segments. So if I have a, two points and a line segment joining them, and I'd like to find a vector equation describing that line segment, well, I could just proceed the way that I did with lines. I could have an initial vector being the position vector going to P. And then I could have a direction vector, the vector that goes from P to Q. Now, one thing that's important about line segments is they're bounded. So that means the value on T has to be bounded. And in fact, it's going to be go from 0 to 1. When T equals 0, I'm at the point P. When T equals 1, I'm at the point Q. Let's go ahead and put in some actual values here, the position vector for P. And then remember, PQ would be the position vector for Q minus the position vector for P. And again, ever important, T only goes between 0 and 1. Now I'm going to do something different. Rather than actually calculate the direction vector, I'm going to notice that I have my position vector, OP, in two places. I have my position vector, OP, 
as my initial vector. And then it's also in here where it's multiplied by t, but with a subtraction or a minus sign in front of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out that op vector. So I'm going to have it multiplied by 1 in the front, and then here it's being multiplied by negative t. So I'll have a factor of 1 minus t in front of op, and then a factor of t in front of oq. And as always, I'm only going between 0 and 1 with the t values. Now this is really a nice way, it really illustrates uh, when you write it this way, that when t equals 0, you're going to have the position vector for p. And when t equals 1, the first term drops out, and you're left with the position vector for q. So we'd like to write the equation of a line segment in that form to really emphasize that, again, when t equals 0, the second term vanishes. And I'm just left with 1 times the position vector for p. But when t equals 1, the first term vanishes. And I'm left with 1 times the position vector for q. And of course, t only goes between 0 and 1. The line segment is bounded, so the values on t have to be bounded as well. Now, instead of using position vector op and oq, we may just use r0 for the initial vector and r1 for the final point or the final vector. Again, t only goes between 0 and 1. And this idea of taking uh, 1 minus t times the initial uh, plus t times the final uh, appears throughout mathematics. And in fact, there's a name for this. We call it the affine sum of r0 and r1. So I hope you've enjoyed this video on the equations of lines. And what comes up next is the equations of planes.